ladies, a very good morning to everybody. I am as usual glad to find this time uh, to speak to you. But as much as I'm also glad that we find time to, to gather in Christ's name so that we can share a little bit from, from his work. I call it a little bit because uh, it's a short time that we always have uh, in, a, in a day. We can never cover everything. But then that means we probably need to squeeze more time uh, together so that we can be able to cover as much ground as we can. Uh, because if we feast on his word, uh, it means uh, we are going to be able to live well because his word will actually now reach us and it will make us very fat, fat boom booms uh, from, from his way. So we probably need uh, to be having more slots uh, together just to study or even just to sing uh, songs praising. The last time out when I was here, I had a, a sermon that I believe was beneficial to all of us at least judging from some of you who are always generous with your comments, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, even though it was mainly targeted at, uh, at youngsters, but I believe all of us, we got one thing or two that will actually help us uh, as we live uh, as Christians. Today I have another uh, lesson that is targeted at a certain group of people among us. And this group is uh, ladies. Uh, I'm targeting you today. Um, it's going to be beneficial to all of us, of course, but I'm inclined more to, to ladies than I am to men. But not, of course, saying that men cannot learn anything from this particular woman, women that we talk about in the past. So, to help me do that, we are actually going to look at uh, uh, some biblical women that are actually mentioned in the Bible. Uh, I will probably look at those that did good uh, or those that we can call good women in the Bible uh, but time the meeting some other day uh, I will also try and have a look at those that were really evil and those that we were bent on doing things that were not right. I'm doing that because if we, if we have, I don't believe God just put these women and tell us some stories about them in the Bible uh, just to uh, embellish the Bible or just to decorate the Bible. But he actually did that so that we can actually learn uh, good traits, good characteristics, uh, good things from them. It might be a man, it might be a child, it might be women that are mentioned in the Bible. They are not mentioned there as a coincidence, but they are mentioned there so that we can actually learn something from them. The stories are for us to learn. I like what uh, Paul would say in First Corinthians uh, in chapter 10, for example, when he was writing about those things that happened in the Old Testament, uh, he actually said they are there and they are actually recorded for our example, so that we can actually learn from them as we actually move forward. So, the, when God created, we were just looking at the creation uh, in our, uh, our morning class. When he created, the first woman uh, was called Eve. I think we actually looked at the meaning of the, the name Eve in the morning to those that were here. You now know what that name means. When Eve was created, if, if we are to go by the debt that is always given, Asha's debt that is about creation, uh, which would be about 4000 BC, let's stick to that date for now. Not saying, of course, that's the specific or the uh, very date or day or year that, that the world was created. But if that, that becomes our working date, for example, or working year, um, if it's actually going to be created about 80, I mean about BC 4000. But there are going to be many, many other women that are actually going to be born in between, that are just mentioned in passing in the Bible uh, after Eve. And God did not find time to actually tell us more about them. You remember there were women, all men that are mentioned in the Bible, they actually had wives. But we don't know about them, even knowing their names, we are not told about their names. Do we know Noah's wife's name? We don't know. Do we know uh, Lord's wife's name? We don't know. Many, many women that are mentioned in between. Do we know uh, 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 the three sons of Noah's wife's names? Again, we don't know. God did not see the importance in mentioning those names. 
but there is one lady who is actually going to find uh, a slot in those women that are mentioned in the Bible. And the name is actually called Sarah. Sarah is actually going to exist plus or minus 2,000 years after Eve. So for about 2,000 years that existed between Sarah and Eve, there is no woman that actually is mentioned by name, and there is no woman whose history we were told about. God would just tell us in the Bible that there was so and so, there was so and so who married a, a wife. And we don't have much information about it. Again, that's not by coincidence that Sarah is actually going to be mentioned by name, and that Sarah, we are actually going to be told a little bit more about her in her life. She is mentioned for the first time in the Bible in Genesis chapter 11. And in chapter 11, the Bible mentions her in passing, and she is actually mentioned as Abraham's wife. We don't know, we are not told much about that in chapter 11 until we get to chapter 12 when Abraham is going to be instructed to leave the heir of Chaldeans, the heir of the Chaldeans, because God is saying, I am going to give you a land. So he actually is going to leave heir, he is actually going to travel up to, up to Haran, then he has to come down to, 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 to Canaan, moves into Egypt, comes back and settles somewhere around Yashaba Jera there, where he actually is going to settle and they are going to separate with Lot when God is actually going to be coming to occupy the other places that were towards the Sodom and Gomorrah. Sarah, by that time, we now have a, a, a lot more information about Sarah. But what is it that we can actually learn about Sarah? I remember, as we continue reading, when we come to uh, uh, chapter, chapter 16 of the book of Genesis, uh, uh, Sarah is actually going to suggest to his husband, because she is not giving him children. So she actually is going to sympathize with the husband. I mean, then, even until now, in many, many societies, if somebody is not having children, they are always regarded as something. That, that, that actually happens. So Sarah is actually going to look at Abraham, and he looks at the world that Abraham has, and he said to Abraham, if you die, no one is going to inherit this. God has actually forbidden me from, from, from having children. So what, what, why... What, what, what's wrong if we are actually going to take my servant maid called Abba and you actually make her your wife? Probably God is going to give us children to him. So, of course, we know that Ishmael is actually going to be born in Genesis chapter 16, but the moment that Abba fell pregnant, she of course was now looking down upon her, her mistress, upon her, 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 her boss, that was Sarah, because she was telling herself, I am pregnant and you are not uh, fertile, so what can you tell me? We always have that problem, of course, of believing and thinking that if we are here, something that does, something doesn't yet, then I am a boss or something like that. But uh, Sarah is not going to take that nonsense. When Ada did that, Sarah is actually going to instantly suggest that she should be dismissed. And she was dismissed and she went away. Of course, we know the story that an angel is going to find her somewhere down there and she is actually going to bring her back and she's going to give birth to, to, to Ishmael and Ishmael is going to be given uh, that name Ishmael by his father, of course. She doesn't take that nonsense because she wanted things to be done right. Even though she's the one that it actually suggested that she had to be uh, Abraham's wife. But when we come to chapter 21 of the book of Genesis, Sarah herself is going to have a child. The child that we actually know today is Isaac. When Isaac is born, uh, Sarah is going to come back to, to Abraham and say, now I have my own child. But I don't want this, this, this servant woman to continue living here because her child who was around 12 years then, Ishmael, is going to inherit or is going to become an heir as well with my son. I don't want that to happen. So she has to be cast out. And of course, she's actually going to be cast out and she, 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 uh, Abba and Ishmael were actually cast out of the home and they actually went. The Bible actually says this displaced Abraham, but Sarah stuck to her guns and she actually made sure that Hagar uh, um, was swept out of the world. Why am I talking about these stories? Because I actually want us to look at this woman called Sarah and look at some good traits and good characteristic, characteristics in here that we, we as women of today can also follow and can also adopt and they will obviously help us as well as women that are actually Christian women and women that actually want to live uh, the, Christian, the Christian way and copy from the, the ladies that lived before us. There's one thing that I, I've seen in Sarah, which is feminists. 
If she yet to be firm, Sarah was very firm. If she made a decision, it doesn't matter whether that decision pleased Abraham or it displeased Abraham, but if that was the right decision to make at the time to protect the family, Sarah went ahead and she stuck to her guards. As wives, as, as women of today, are we also able to be firm as and when we are supposed to be firm? The, the, the problem that we might actually encounter in many instances is that we become firm where we are not supposed to be firm and we probably are slacking where we are supposed to be firm. But if we are going to be firm, just like Sarah, where we are supposed to be firm, we are actually copying that trait from this lady that actually is, was called Sarah. And people, ladies of today also need to get that characteristic from her, the characteristic of being firm. She was also protective of her, of her temple. Imagine. Uh, in chapter 21, we've got a, a situation where she's going to tell the husband that this seven woman and her child, I don't want them to inherit the, 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 the things that I work for. She's a seven woman and she should go away. I now have a son who is called Isaac. I not going to entertain a situation where you, Abraham, you are going to divide my wealth among the two boys. Let her go away. She is protecting her territory making sure that everything that belongs to the family would not be shared by those that did not deserve it. If you want to go in that way, of course we understand and we believe that God was always left in hand in that because he had chosen Isaac to be the one that was going to uh, uh, inherit everything. But she also, in doing everything, the, the trait that I actually want to talk about a little bit more is what Paul, I mean what Peter, what would not escape Peter in that passage that we read today, particularly in verse 6. Verse 6 actually tells us, when Peter is writing in 1 Peter chapter 10, verse 1 to 6, uh, in verse 6 in particular, he actually tells us about Sarah. Let, let, let's go there and, and, and read what Peter actually says. Sarah, at right, the time that Peter is writing this, Sarah is long dead. She had lived so many, 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 many years before, but this is what Peter is actually going to say about Sarah. In verse 5, he says, for this is how the holy women who walked in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good, and if you do not fear anything that is frightening. Sarah called Abraham her Lord. But she knew when to call him Lord, and she knew when not to call him Lord. And also, when she was calling him Lord, she was not saying that you have overtaken the actual Lord. You have overtaken the real Lord, and you are the Lord. She knew that he was Lord with a, 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 a small letter L. She, he was Lord in the sense that he, he was her husband. But not that he had become Lord, meaning God. So when he was saying Lord to him, Peter actually says, she was showing submissiveness and she was also showing obedience. But imagine, this is the very Sarah who actually told Abraham that I don't want your second wife and your child here. Kick them out. Even though Abraham was displeased by that, she still said, I want them gone and they went away. But she still finds those descriptive words to say she was still submissive. How can you be submissive to your husband when you can actually tell your husband some things that your husband is not going to be pleased with? If you are saying things that are right, whether the husband is going to be pleased or they are not going to be pleased, as long as what we are saying is right, you are doing exactly as Sarah did. Stick to the right things and say those things to your husband. Don't fold arms and always fall uh, simply because they are your husbands. Yes, they are your lords. According to Sarah, we are your lords. But even though we are, we still have to be controlled. Where we have to be controlled. That's exactly what Sarah did. And Abraham did and obeyed what she was actually doing. We don't have much time to talk about Sarah. Let's continue and talk about other women. But I want you to take away from Sarah her feminists. I also want you to take away from her her protectiveness, protecting her territory. But most importantly, Remember that she was always submissive to her husband and she was actually obeying. In fact, that's exactly what Peter says there. He actually says you should be submit to your husband. 
he says, your adornment of things should not only be from the outside. When we look at you, we are looking at a smart woman, but inside you are not. Peter is saying that's wrong because Sarah was adorning herself outside, but she also would go inside and she would still adorn herself with the right things, with the right characteristics. And women of today also need to do the same. I want to talk about this other woman. I don't know if many of you would actually remember if I talk about this man. Maybe not even remember, because you can only remember something that you ever heard. Uh, maybe some of you never heard this name at all, even though uh, it's there in the Bible. There's a woman who is mentioned in, in, interestingly in the New King James, in the King James Version, only twice. Once in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, and second time in the book of Numbers. And her name is called Joker Ben. Who oh, no. If I were to ask you to show me by raising up your head, who oh, remember this lady that is called Joker Ben? And who was she? The rest don't remember this woman. But there is something that I want you to, to remember, starting from now going forward, about this woman that is actually called Joker Ben. In Exodus chapter 2, there is a man who actually is going to get married. But when the time they are married, Israelites are actually living in Egypt. And they are actually going to get married during the time when things were not right at all for the children of Israel while they were living in Egypt. So there is a decree that has come out from King Pharaoh that all boy children that are going to be born, they are supposed to be killed at birth. This lady is actually going to have a child. And when she had a child in Exodus chapter 2, she actually looked at the child and she looked at a fine child. And she tried to hide this child for at least three months. But she was risking her life because the king wanted all boy children to die. But she's going to hide the, 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 the boy for about three months. But when she could not continue hiding this boy any longer, she actually made a basket and put the baby. And she actually took the baby into the Nile River where the, the baby was actually going to be, to be found. This is our Nile River where the, the baby was actually going to be every day. So whenever she wanted to go and feed her, feed the, 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 the baby, she would actually go down. But in the meantime, when she's not there, she actually chose her, her daughter to be guarding the baby from afar to make sure that nothing wrong was actually going to be happening to the boy. This woman is actually called Jokapet, if you did not. And the baby that we are talking about is actually the man that we know as the, the, the Moses the Moses of the Old Testament. Her mother was called Jogab, and her father was called Amram. Please, you can take note of that, and you will know that forever. Now, I want to talk about Jogab, about the traits and the characteristics, good or characteristics that she actually had. In, in our modern day, in our societies, we have read, we have seen on television, we have, uh, uh, hear, we have heard from radios about women who actually give birth and they go and they throw away their babies, their infants, uh, in the dustbins. They go and throw them uh, in the, the, the storm drains. We have heard of them that were actually thrown into pit latrines, stuff like that. We have women that are actually doing that today. But they would have given birth to these children under no pressure at all. There is no war, there is no decree that a child should die. But Jokabed gave a child, gave birth to a child when there was a decree from a king a king of Egypt, that all boy children were to die, she is not going to listen to the king, risking her life, but she actually is going to take care of this boy, and of course this boy is going to change the course of history of the Israelites. You don't mention the Bible without mentioning Moses. You don't mention the Old Testament without Moses. It's not by coincidence that even the Old Testament is actually called the Mosaic law, because this young man, this boy baby, who had to be Hidden for some time along the river Nile was given birth to by this woman who is called Jokabed. So what is it that we can learn from this woman called Jokabed? Nothing more than love, nothing more than caring for your infant, caring for your children, caring for your for your for your for your infants. What does it mean then to care for somebody's children? I think we at times in our modern day, in our modern times, we overdo it. Because we believe that caring for your children is not to discipline them. I think I remember in one of the Psalms, uh, in one of the Prophets, where it, chapter 22 that is, where it is actually talked about sparing the rod and you spoil the child. It's not always the truth, of course, uh, that if you always hit them, they're going to be right. Or even if you spare them, they're not going to be right. 
But that is the basic principle that the writer of the book of Proverbs was actually laying for us. That we need to discipline our children. Even God himself actually wants discipline in his church. He has even laid uh, the foundation. He has even laid the process in which somebody who is delinquent is supposed to be, uh, to be disciplined in the church. We need to discipline our children. We need to take care of them. Taking care of them, ladies, does not mean you make them mommy's boy, mommy's boy or mommy's girl, that they are now untouchables, that what they are supposed to do for themselves, they can't do. We have, uh, we have uh, I've heard somebody, uh, a certain singer, often talked about, uh, you know, rearing your children while we are putting them in a tray, like they are eggs. Because if you just, you think they are fragile. Children are not fragile. They need your discipline. But at times we actually go off uh, the track and we actually think they are fragile and we are not supposed to say bad things to them when we are supposed to do that. That's discipline. They need discipline coming from you, even though you, you would have cared for them like what Jacob did. But you still need to discipline them. Let's move on to another woman who is called Zipporah. I'm sure we all know this woman called Zipporah, the woman that is actually going to be married by uh, by, by Moses, the baby Moses who would be hidden in a basket. He is going to grow up and now he's thinking of marrying and he's actually going to marry this wife uh, called Zipporah in Midian. When he came to Midian, he's actually going to, to get married to, to, to Zipporah. He is going to be there for about 40 years. But when he sees the burning bushes recorded in, in Exodus chapter 3, he has to move back to come and redeem these people from Egypt. But when he came along the way, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 4, that when they were lodging at a lodge, at an inn, whatever they would call it then, uh, for overnight, so that they would continue their journey tomorrow to go back to Egypt. Something actually was going to happen. God came and God wanted to kill Moses. You would wonder why would God want to kill Moses. God has come to Midian. He has instructed Moses to go back to Egypt. But along the way, before his mission is accomplished, he wants to kill him. Why does he want to kill him? Because of disobedience. You remember going back to Abraham. Abraham had actually been told by God that he was supposed to circumcise his, his, his children. So every, every child uh, who was born through Abraham, at the day, at the eighth day, all males were supposed to be circumcised. When Moses came from Egypt, and he actually came to Midian, and he got married, he had two children, Geshom and Eliezer. We don't have a record of him circumcising, circumcising these boys. Think of a Christian who moves out of the comfort zone, they go away and they completely forget about the principles. When he was in Egypt, he knew he had been circumcised himself and he knew that God had said to their forefather that this was a covenant <coughs> they needed to do. When he came here, he forgot about the covenant. Now God is about to put a sword on him. He wants to kill him. There's something that his wife called Zipporah is going to do. She actually is going to reach out for a flint knife and she is going to circumcise the man. And the angel is actually going to spare Moses. There is something that I want you to see in Zipporah. I don't know at what stage yet she had been told by Moses that they were supposed to be circumcised. I don't know at what stage yet Moses told you that all children who are <laughs> children or who are offsprings of Abraham are supposed to be, to be circumcised. But quickly, because of her alertness, because of her awareness of the surroundings, she quickly thought that what is going to happen to Moses must have been because Moses was disobedient. And she's going to cover up for that gap. Covering the gap for your husband's mistakes. If they do something that is wrong, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, you are there as their helpers and you are there as their partners. I think that's exactly what God would say when he was creating uh, if that he wanted to get a partner, uh, a helper, a companion for, for Adam. You are a companion of a man, so when they've done something that is wrong, you cover up for each other. She actually is going to cover up for Moses, and she actually did what Moses had failed to do, and she actually, she must have been taught by Moses, she must have been taught by Moses. She had never lived in Egypt, she had never seen these people being circumcised, but she quickly remembered that this must be the cause for Moses' imminent death, and she actually did what was supposed to be done. Fighting on behalf of your wife. And of course, fighting on behalf of your husband. We need to do that. And as ladies as well, we just need to be like Zipporah. We need to be aware, to be alert. So many ladies after their husbands have died, uh, you ask them a question, 
did, did your husband have a, 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 a funeral point? I don't know. Did you have any pension scheme somewhere? I don't know. Uh, is are all your bills, water bills, lesser bills, everything, is it up to date? I don't know. Uh, what then do you know? Zipporah would actually know those bits and pieces of information because they are info, bits and pieces of information that will also help you even if your husband passes on. So many ladies actually come into trouble. So many ladies cannot live the way they are supposed to live because when the husband was there, they did not know anything about the husband. They did not know anything that was relevant which would actually help them thereafter to move on. You need to be alert. You need to be aware of what you are supposed to be aware of. Be one with your husband. Ask all the necessary information so that even if the husband is off, we know that at least you are reliable because you also have the information just like what Zipporah did. Be aware, be alert. Fight for your husband in the process. But there is another lady also who is called Ra. You remember this lady who actually is mentioned in the book uh, of Joshua chapter 2. Joshua with the people, they are not supposed to cross the river Jordan to come into the promised land. But there is something that is going to happen at Jericho. But before he crosses in, Joshua is actually going to send two spies that are going to live in, 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 in Jericho. And this woman is actually going to accept them in her house. But when she lived with them, I like what she said. Go and read Joshua chapter 2 and hear what Ra actually said. She actually said, we have heard stories about you. We have heard how, what, what the disaster that you actually did to the Egyptians. We have heard the disaster that you did to all those nations that were trying to block you. But we know that it is because God is fighting for you. How did she know that God was fighting for them? The south of what the Israelites had done, it actually reached Jericho. Instead of the Jericho residents to give up, they still wanted to fight against Israel. But Rab said, we know that God is fighting for you. So please, can you have favor for me? I am going to house you while you are spying, but I will also ask for your favor. Please, when you come to destroy Jericho, may you spare me and my family. And of course, he was spared because of that. It's, it's, it's actually interesting that as you go on, you will actually discover that this Rab was just a prostitute, an outcast in the society. She actually becomes one of the pillars in the genealogy of Jesus. She actually become, becomes the, one of the ancestresses of Jesus Christ. She is actually mentioned. Because after that, she is actually going to be mentioned to be married to an Israelite. And she actually is going to be uh, the mother of Boaz, who then became the father of Obed and Liv. And from Obed, Obed became the father of Jesse, who became the father of David. And David, of course, we know that Jesus is actually being called the branch of David. All that is because of Rab's faith. A faithful woman who was an outcast at first, but she actually became faithful. So what we learn from there as women, I think we can learn that uh, we can actually have faith with works. Our faith should produce works. I think this is exactly what James tries to explain in the book of James. You remember that when he talks about, chapter 2 talks about faith, that faith without works which is actually dead. Rab was faithful, she had faith, but her faith was not useless because her faith was put into action. We also need to have faith, faith in God, faith in our families, faith in our husbands, but that faith should actually produce works. It shouldn't just be an open faith that actually does not help us with anything. We have many, many other ladies, and we don't have time to mention them of the Old Testament. Deborah, you may read that in the book of Judges. We actually have another woman who also is mentioned in, incidentally in the book of Judges, who is called Jael, J-A-E-L. We also have another woman who, with one of the Old Testament books dedicated to her, who is actually called Esther. You need to read that book to actually know what this young lady did. Let's move on to the New Testament and talk about just two ladies, then we can wrap up what we are saying. We have another lady in the New Testament who actually is called Anna. Uh, again, she's one lady that is almost anonymous in the Bible. 
Very few of us would actually know about this woman who is actually called Anna. She's mentioned in Luke chapter 2 and she was from the tribe of Asher. She's actually mentioned as a faithful woman. I think who only lived for six, six or seven years with her husband. The husband died and by the time that she mentioned, she's mentioned in Luke chapter 2, she was 84. But it's interesting that the Bible actually mentions that she was always praying and fasting because she was looking forward for the one that was coming to redeem the children of Israel. She was so faithful, so stuck to her belief that she did not want to leave God. She always wanted to live for God. Every other time she would come to the temple to worship, to pray, and to fast. Simply because she was hoping uh, to see this one that was actually going to come. Read Luke chapter 2, you meet this woman. There's Elizabeth, there's Mary. Whether you're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, or you're talking about Mary Magdalene, it doesn't matter. Those Marys were faithful. Whether you're talking about Tabitha, Jokas, we briefly talked about her in the morning. She's mentioned in Acts chapter 9. The lad is said to have been full of good works. And she also had charity uh, in here. Charity begins at home. She also had charity. She had very many good works. We also have another woman called Lydia who showed hospitality to, 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 to Paul and his kids when they were in Philippi. You remember this lady. Again, you actually need to go to Acts chapter 16 to know about that story. We are not going to talk more about that, about that lady. Let me just finish by talking about Priscilla. In Acts chapter 18, we meet this woman uh, who was working with her husband called Aquila. And uh, when they are mentioned the first time, they are actually going to take aside this man that was actually called Apollos. And they are going to uh, uh, instruct him according to the way of God. But I do not dwell much into that. Even though it is very important that we take from Priscilla that a good woman, a woman of virtue, is actually going to work with her husband for the cause of Christ. They are going to work together for the cause of God. But for us to be able to do that, it means all of us, both of us, we should be knowing something. If Priscilla did not know anything, and it was only Aquila who knew something, she would not have been mentioned as taking Apollos aside to instruct him in the way of the Lord. She must have been a well-read somebody who actually knew what God wanted. And you as a modern woman, a Christian woman, you also need to know that. You also need to work with your husband for that cause. But what I want us to, to be a spiritual helper of your husband, what I want us to look at in Priscilla is the hospitality that is actually mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, particularly in verse 19. When Paul is writing the letter to the Corinthians, he actually mentioned this couple, deliberate, and he actually says, and the church that meets in their hearts. That's not a small job, to have the whole church. We don't know how big this church was, but I'm saying it's not a small job, to have all of us coming every Sunday, and we are actually going to come into your house, and this is where we are going to meet. How would you accept that? How would you receive that as a woman? A Christian woman, can we come and worship in your, in your house? Let's do that. Show me, ladies. Can we? Are you able to sustain us week in, week out? We are actually coming, and when we say we are going to church, as we use, use that word, we are actually coming to your house. Maybe some of us who are not will actually be saying we are going to pay this house, or we are going to precious house, or, or to whoever. That's where we meet as Christians. It's not always possible. Because many of you, if I may ask, when last did you ever receive a Christian in your house? Just visit him. Just one. When last do you remember receiving? I know you received there sometime. Me and my wife, we came to your house the other time. I know. But who else has received recently, in the recent times? Who has received Christian, Christian in your house? Is it difficult to receive even one? But listen to what. Paul would say about Priscilla, the church that was living, I mean that was worshipping in their house. They lived in Ephesus. And the church would actually come and meet in their house. I, I don't know whether you would want to call that hospitality, but I don't think, I think hospitality doesn't really describe this woman. To me it's more, it's, 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 it's way above if you have any other word that you can use in place of hospitality. This is what she wants. But what was the reason which caused her to do that? And what was the reason which caused all these other women to do it? I, I think about what Paul said when he was writing uh, in the book of Second, um, in the book of Second Corinthians, when he was talking about the Macedonians, and uh, he was actually talking about their 
them being poor, but you are saying they are giving. It does not match uh, what they are. They are very poor, but they are giving beyond their nature. But I like the, 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 the phrase that he used there. He actually said they do that. They are able to do that because they gave themselves to Christ first before they thought about giving anything. We can do anything. We can give out anything as long as we are able to give ourselves to Christ first before we can think about giving anything. If, if, if you are, what does it mean to give yourself to Christ? To boldly tell yourself that I don't belong to myself. I belong to him. So if I belong to him, I like what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. You remember he actually says, I have been crucified. And it's no longer me who lives, but Christ who is actually living in me. That, that, that's a big statement. If any one of us would make such a statement one day, it means that we can then do anything. We can do what Sarah did. You can do what Zipporah did. We can do what Jacob did. We can do what Priscilla did. As long as we give ourselves first to God, then we now say, whatever we have does not belong to me. What, what, what profit is there for me to protect, for example, my, 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 my house, and I don't want Christians to come there, I, I, I don't want anyone to visit me, Christians included. What, what, what is a house? Where did I get this house from? It's because we are actually attaching more importance to these things of this world, forgetting that actually God is more important than all these things. In fact, we got them from Him, and we are supposed to use them to serve As women, as Christian women of today, let me call you modern women, are we prepared to, 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 to come down? Because to some extent it's climbing down to come and match the characteristics of Sarah, who actually came to his husband, to her husband, and she actually said, old as I am, when the two angels had actually been sent, to come and announce, I think it's in Genesis chapter 17, to come and announce the birth of Isaac. And she overheard them talking to Abraham that this time, next year, you will be having a child. She's looking at herself, she's 89, and the Lord is now 99, and she actually loved it. She said, is it possible I am worn out, and my Lord, talking about Abraham, he also is worn out. How can we have that luxury of having a child? And of course, we know that at 90 and at 100, they actually had a child. In fact, that, that love, which is mentioned there, is the one that then caused Isaac to be called Isaac, because that name means he loves. The name Isaac means laughing, of course. So, we can only match Sarah, we can match any other woman in the Bible, but the key is to give ourselves first to Christ, to be like what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that it's no longer me who lives. I own a car, it's not my car. I own a house, it's not my house. I have money, it's not my money. That money, that car, that house, let me use it to serve the Lord because I got it from him and it's his. So let me just use it to serve. Next time, invite Christians to come into your home. Christian women, uh, not Christian men without their women. Christian women, let invite them. Show hospitality like Priscilla. Where I live, if people are, if run out of space to, to where, where to meet, to have a meeting place. I can offer my home because we see those standards in the Bible where people were meeting in their homes. But again, I emphasize the point that for that to happen, for all of us to, to be able to do that, we need to give ourselves first to Christ, like what the Macedonians did. Once we do that, then we are going to be able to say, whatever I have does not belong to me. I can actually use it for the cause of Christ. We have so many women that we can actually talk about in the Bible, and I don't believe we have time to do that. But I think those few that we have talked about, uh, it, to me, we were not talking about them deeply. I think you can actually go and do yourself a favor and read, why would Sarah be called? Why would the writer of the book of First Peter find space in the writings to talk about Sarah? Specifically about Sarah, there must be something good that she did for her to be mentioned a submissive. In fact, that whole passage from 1 to 6, it actually is talking about you women to be submissive to your, to your husband. That's what God requires, but you don't then become dumb simply because this is my husband. You are submissive where you are su supposed to be, where you are supposed to correct your husband. Again, you are supposed to do the correction as and when it is required. 
remembering that our Lord is not your husband, but the Lord, the real Lord, is the Lord himself, who also created your husband and who created you. I hope uh, those ladies that we have mentioned are going to inspire us. We are going to read more about them and we will probably find one or two or three things that can actually improve our families, that will improve us in our personal capacities, and that will also improve the, the Church of God here at New Side and even in the universal sense. Because that is our purpose of living on earth, so that we can actually propagate the word of God to all those people who see us. But women, we are having a chance to do that only if we are able to take some traits and some characteristics of the biblical women that we were talking about and looking at this morning. Thank you.